Hello, all you freedom-loving people. Welcome to another episode of Front Page. I'm your host, Scott Cameron Goulet. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis signed a Senate bill in front of a wall of pictures of brigade men at the Bay of Pigs Museum in Florida. Florida will start to teach about the atrocities of communism. The U.S. Deputy National Security Advisor during the Trump administration criticized the Biden administration for being too soft on the Chinese Communist Party, making the global situation volatile. The Speaker of the House introduced a new foreign funding bill and a new border management bill, but they will be voted on separately. This also puts his position as Speaker in jeopardy. Senate Democrats voted to dismiss two impeachment articles against Secretary of Homeland Security Alejandro Mayorkas. Attorney General Merrick Garland received a final warning to comply with subpoenas for President Joe Biden's interview with Special Counsel Robert Herr. Governor Brian Kemp defended a new commission set up to discipline rogue prosecutors for refusing to uphold the law and to prosecute certain crimes, and Boeing is still under fire for building planes that are not up to specs. Okay, let's get into it. Every school grade level in Florida will be instructed on the dangers and history of communism. This will begin in the 2026-2027 school year. On April 17th, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis said, we're going to tell the truth about the evils of communism. We're going to tell the truth about the unprecedented death toll of the 20th century at the hands of communist tyranny. DeSantis mentioned the 100 million people killed by communist regimes spreading from the Soviet Union to Cuba and to China. He asserted, those are the facts and those are what we need to be very clear-eyed about now. DeSantis stood at the podium with a sign reading, anti-communist education. Governor DeSantis signed the Senate bill in front of a wall of pictures of brigade men at the Bay of Pigs Museum in Florida. This was in honor of the 63rd anniversary of the failed attempt to usurp communism in Cuba. Bay of Pig survivor and Vietnam veteran Felix Rodriguez said, This law is very, very important to all of us. I hope that every state of the union will adopt this type of law. We have too many professors that are leftist teaching the wrong ideology to our students. Rodriguez added, None of them have lived in a communist country, and none of them will ever go to a communist country. They do not know what socialism means. We do. The 2023-2024 school year became the first year for all high school students to take a U.S. government class. The class is required to have 45 minutes of instruction on the atrocities of communism. The course covers the Russian Revolution of 1917 and the rise of Mao Zedong in China. It also covers the totalitarian regime of Nicolas Maduro and the Chavismo movement in Venezuela. Florida Department of Education Commissioner Manny Diaz Jr. noted that this legislation will make the state's communism education much more comprehensive. It will focus on the history of communism in the United States. It will review activists and communist tactics and movements in the United States and beyond. It will also include Cuba's communist policies and the spread of communist ideologies throughout Latin America and other foreign countries. Matt Pottinger, the U.S. Deputy National Security Advisor during the Trump administration, understands the Chinese. He is a genuine China expert. Pottinger published an article with Mike Gallagher criticizing Biden for signaling the wrong message to the CCP by sending a number of high-ranking officials to China, and more importantly, Beijing has not been kind to them. Pottinger, in his new piece entitled No Substitute for Victory, argues outspokenly for defeating communist China rather than just keeping a low competitive profile. In his article, he said that the CCP has launched a new Cold War against the U.S. and that the U.S. should not deny or ignore the existence of the Cold War or it could lead to a hot war. The goal of America should be to defeat the CCP, even if this could lead to serious friction in the Sino-American relationship. The article points out in the competition between the United States and the Chinese Communist Party, the Biden administration has strategically prioritized a short-term thaw with the CCP at the expense of a long-term victory over the CCP's malignant strategy. The Biden team's 
diplomatic strategy emphasizes process at the expense of results, and it pursues bilateral stability at the expense of global security. The article recognizes that Biden has maintained tariffs on China, sanctioned companies linked to the Chinese military, restricted Chinese technology that threatens national security, and it has strengthened relations with Indo-Pacific allies. But Washington has been too disorganized in its handling of relations with Russia, Iran, North Korea, and China, making China the biggest beneficiary of the chaos in international relations. The article cautions that dismantling or at least blowing up the CCP's Great Firewall must be at the center of Washington's policy today, just as the Reagan administration's policy was to dismantle the Berlin Wall. Washington should work hard to spread the truth in China. Washington should work hard to disseminate truthful information inside China so that Chinese citizens can communicate safely with each other. The great cash out, Bezos, Zuckerberg, and Jamie Dimon sell their stocks for the first time ever. The tech share selling by hedge funds ranked among the highest in five years. The AI bubble is nearly identical to the dot-com bubble of 2000. Meanwhile, Barron's warns that the banking crisis could be closer than you think. The U.S. banking system is sitting on $2.2 trillion of unrealized losses. J.P. Morgan warns investors should brace for a 1970s era stagflation period. The 1970s were marked by high inflation and wars in Vietnam and the Middle East. Does this sound familiar? Stocks were flat from 1967 to 1980. Stanley Drunken Miller and Blackstone warn of a lost decade ahead for stocks. So isn't it time you protect your retirement with gold? It's time to call the proud Americans of the Patriot Gold Group. Call them today before it's too late. Tell them that Front Page with Scott Goulet sent you and you'll always get the best in class service from Patriots protecting Patriots. The Patriot Gold Group has the no fee for life IRA where your IRA or 401k can be in physical gold and silver and you may be eligible for the no fee for life IRA on qualifying rollovers. So call the toll free number 888-857-0495 and get a free investor guide today. Patriot Gold Group is Consumer Affairs top rated gold IRA dealer seven years in a row. Again, call 888-857-0495. That's 888-857-0495. On April 17th, Senate Democrats voted to dismiss two impeachment articles against Secretary of Homeland Security Alejandro Mayorkas. This was less than three hours after his impeachment trial began. The dismissals followed vocal objections from Senate Republicans. The Senate Republicans said that not holding a full trial violated the Constitution. It was the first time in history that the upper chamber had moved to dispose of a trial before allowing impeachment articles to be heard. There were two articles. The first impeachment article accused Mayorkas of refusing to enforce immigration laws. The second article charged him with breaching public trust and making false statements to Congress. Shortly after, all 100 senators were sworn in as jurors for the trial. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer raised points of order to dismiss each of the two articles effectively. Schumer argued that the articles did not meet the threshold of high crimes and misdemeanors required under the Constitution. The Senate voted on party lines 51 to 48 to dismiss the first impeachment article. Senator Lisa Murkowski voted present. The chamber later voted on party lines 51 to 49 to dismiss the second impeachment article. However, Senate Republicans raised motions to thwart Schumer's moves. They argued that the Constitution required a full impeachment trial. Of course, the Department of Homeland Security welcomed the Senate's dismissal. The DHS claimed that it proves definitively that there was no evidence or constitutional grounds to justify impeachment. However, Senate Minority Whip John Thune said that President Joe Biden and Mayorkas' policies have led to the worst border crisis in American history. Thune said that the Senate was responsible for hearing the impeachment articles. Senator Eric Schmidt also said that the Senate Majority Leader was setting our Constitution ablaze and bulldozing 200 years of precedent. House Speaker Mike Johnson revealed a series of foreign aid bills on April 17th, including funding for Ukraine, Israel, Taiwan, and other Indo-Pacific partners. The three bills 
which total $95 billion, will fund Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan. About two-thirds, $61 billion would go to Ukraine. More than $26 billion will go to Israel, of which $16.5 billion is for military finance, and nearly $10 billion is planned for humanitarian relief for the inhabitants of the Gaza Strip. The fourth bill includes a range of foreign policy proposals. This includes allowing the U.S. to seize frozen assets of Russia's central bank, imposing sanctions on Iran, Russia, and China, and revising the TikTok ban. By combining the four bills into a single rule, Johnson gives the House the binary choice of allowing votes on all four bills or none. The rule and the four individual bills need majority support to pass. Johnson said that a vote on the program is expected Saturday night. The White House announced its support for the legislation shortly after its introduction. President Biden wants the House of Representatives to pass the plan this week and the Senate to follow suit as soon as possible, and then he will sign it into law immediately. However, this move might cost Johnson his position as Speaker because the extreme hardliners in the Republican Party, most notably Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene, are upset over this funding of Ukraine without a resolution to the U.S. border crisis. Marjorie Taylor Greene has filed a motion to vacate, which could expel Johnson from the Speaker's office. Now Greene has another ally. Representative Thomas Massey said that he would join Green and call for Johnson's resignation. To satisfy Conservatives, Johnson on Thursday introduced a new border security bill which contains much of the bill known as H.R. 2 that has already passed the House of Representatives last year. According to Johnson, the border security bill is an aggressive measure that is instrumental to the border conversation about national security, but it is moving separately to the foreign aid package. Since the Democrat-controlled Senate had already rejected the border bill that was passed last year, there needed to be more points in submitting another similar bill. Some of Johnson's peers in the House are concerned that because the foreign aid funding and border laws are separate, only the funding packages will be passed in the Democrat-majority Senate, while the border laws will be dead on arrival. Representative Chip Roy of Texas called the strategy a total failure. Representative Bob Good, the chair of the House Freedom Caucus, called it a joke, pretend, and theater. On Tuesday, Attorney General Merrick Garland received a final warning to comply with subpoenas for President Joe Biden's interview with Special Counsel Robert Herr. House Oversight Committee Chair James Comer and Judiciary Committee Chair Jim Jordan wrote to Garland. They noted that Garland would face contempt of Congress proceedings if he failed to comply. Comer and Jordan said, To avoid this, the committees expect you to produce all responsive materials no later than 12 p.m. on April 25, 2024. The DOJ previously offered to provide the transcript of Herr's interview with Biden's book ghostwriter Mark Schwanitzer. However, Republicans say that Biden's transcript and audio are needed to oversee the president's classified document scandal. During the president's interview with her, President Biden experienced mental lapses and poor memory at least seven times. Her's investigation found that Biden willfully retained classified documents. However, he declined to prosecute him, citing insufficient evidence. Her also characterized Biden as an elderly man with a poor memory. A group of Georgia prosecutors has filed a lawsuit challenging a law that established an oversight commission. They argue that the law unfairly curtails their power and it undermines the will of voters, but Governor Brian Kemp claims it merely disciplines rogue prosecutors for refusing to uphold the law and to prosecute certain crimes. On April 16th, a coalition of four district attorneys filed the lawsuit in Fulton County Superior Court. They challenged the constitutionality of the Prosecuting Attorneys Qualifications Commission. This was established when Governor Kemp signed SB 332 into law on March 13th. Kemp argues that the community suffers when out-of-touch public prosecutors prioritize politics over public safety. The plaintiffs claim that the new commission violates Georgia's law, the Georgia Constitution, and the U.S. Constitution in three ways. 
Some Democrats have also expressed fear that the commission could be used to derail Fulton County District Attorney Fannie Willis's prosecution of President Trump. Willis has faced calls for removal from the Trump case amid controversy over her romantic relationship with Nathan Wade. Some legal experts have even said that Willis should be subjected to a criminal investigation amid allegations of perjury and tampering with witnesses. The law mirrors efforts in other states to hold rogue prosecutors accountable for refusing to prosecute certain crimes. However, Democrats oppose the passage of the rule. This is because they claim that the new law could target prosecutors who are involved in the case against President Trump, including Fannie Willis. Yet Republicans who led the effort to pass the law and to establish the panel deny targeting Willis or any specific individual. A whistleblower has alleged that Boeing concealed vital information from investigators about how a door plug blew off one of its 737 MAX 9 jets. On April 17th, former Boeing manager Ed Pearson said, I'm not going to sugarcoat this. This is a criminal cover-up. This was during the second Senate hearing to examine Boeing's safety culture. The Senate Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee held the hearing. Boeing leadership told Congress last month that documents detailing work on the faulty door plug could not be found. This suggested that they were likely never created. However, Pearson said that those documents exist. Pearson is now the executive director of the Foundation for Aviation Safety. He said, I know this because I've personally passed them on to the FBI. This was not Pearson's first alarm about Boeing's practices. In December of 2019, following two 737 MAX crashes that killed 346 people collectively, he testified before Congress about Boeing's rushed production operations. Yet, even after those tragedies, Pearson claimed that nothing had changed at Boeing. He noted there was no accountability. Not a single person from Boeing went to jail. Hundreds of people died and there's been no justice. He added, unless action is taken and leaders are held accountable, every person stepping aboard a Boeing plane is at risk. Pearson is not the only one who has these concerns. Another whistleblower, Boeing quality engineer Sam Salapur, also warned about Boeing. Salapur alleged that Boeing was taking shortcuts to ramp up production. He told the committee they are putting out defective airplanes. Salapur noted that he had personally observed gaps in Boeing's 787 Dreamliner fuselage that exceeded specifications. In the cases he reviewed, the manufacturer left those gaps unaddressed 98.7% of the time. Salapur also testified that he suffered various forms of retaliation after voicing his concerns to Boeing. He said that the reprisals included his transfer to another program. He was also targeted with verbal abuse, threats, and a nail that he believes was deliberately embedded in his tire. Salapur said that an auto shop told him this nail was not picked up through normal driving. Salapur said the nail was inserted when he was at work, but he has no proof. And that's a wrap for this episode. Thank you so much for your support of Front Page. Please remember that every like, comment, and share helps more people to see the truth. If you haven't already, please subscribe. And if you have already subscribed, we thank you. But please double check to make sure that you're still subscribed because some of our audience have reported that they're somehow unsubscribed without their knowledge. We've also heard that many of you don't get notifications of our videos anymore on YouTube. So when you do subscribe on YouTube, please make sure to tap the notification bell as well. Okay, this is our show for today. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you like what you heard today, please don't forget to like this video and share it with your friends and family because everybody deserves to know the truth.